We are now at the last hands-on of the day, which is going to introduce to you the Cubimex and all of the libraries. The goals of this session are to become even more familiar with the STM32, F0 and its ecosystems. So we've already had a play around twice now with the previous hands-on with the F0. So we're now going to expand on the ecosystems part. The method that we're going to use in this section is the Cubamex tool, which will graphically help us create our project and workspace and link all the libraries in. We're still using the same technique, polling, from our application software flows. And the steps that we're going to do are create our Cubamex project, Enable the configuration of the peripherals that we have chosen for our Fermo regulator project. Use the Cubamex tool to generate all our Kyle startup files. So this time we won't be actually using the Kyle new project function. We'll be letting the Cubamex tool do that for us. Then we'll add in the application source code as we've done with the previous two examples. We'll start from a template and we'll paste in the main part of the application source code. Then we'll compile and debug the application as we did in the previous hands-on using the Kyle environment. And then we'll set our LED using the same principles as before where we trigger our threshold for our LED on the target board. So the block diagram for this hands-on is exactly the same as the previous hands-on. So we've still got the temperature sensor and the control button as our two inputs into our MCU. We're still driving the same two outputs, which is the LED to re represent our switch relay out to our heater. And we're going to link in the communications back to our external system, which will be our PC via the virtual COM port. So the same four peripherals are still needed as we did in the previous example. On our Nucleo board, everything stays the same as we had in the previous example. So we're still using the green LED, the blue push button, the external temperature sensor inside the STM32. And in this hands-on, we are actually going to connect to the UART this time so that our PA2 and PA3 from our STM32 will link up to the section you can see highlighted in purple on the top half of the board, section 4, which will then generate our virtual COM port back to our PC. Schematic diagrams for all of these peripherals. We've already seen them in the previous hands-on. So it's still PA5 for the LED, PC13 for the push button, and PA2 and PA3 for the UART. Our flow diagram stays exactly the same. We're now going to cover all these blue boxes. So the three blue boxes at the bottom, which is our push button and our USART, are now also going to get included inside this part of the hands-on. The section now highlighted in blue is what we're going to do with the Cubamex tool. So this is what we're going to now start and configure and lay out the pins to match our hardware schematics you've just previously seen so that we can generate our template for building our code. So now we're going to launch our Cubamex tool and we are going to start configuring our application using the graphical interface inside the Cubamex tool. So we now need to launch Cubamex from our start menu. When you open Cubamex, you'll be presented with the landing page. This is where you can either start a new project or load an existing project. You can also go and check to make sure that your library pack is installed correctly. 
by clicking on the help button on the top menu bar and selecting manage embedded software packages. So here if you expand the F0 family you should hopefully have a green dot in the latest STM32 F0 library pack which means we're now ready to start our application. So we can close that screen and we now need to click on new project in the middle of the screen. This opens a new window which is our MCU selector. This is exactly the same screen as you get with the MCU finder where you've got your parameter selection on the left hand side and your results at the bottom half of the right hand side of the screen. So there are different ways where you can select a product. You can either key in the part number and search that way. You can use the slider bars on the left hand side of the screen to select different memory sizes different pin I.O. counts, different frequencies and then select which peripheral mix you want. Or you also have the ability to select a board level design. So you can select any of these particular boards as your starting point for the CubeMX tool. For what we want to do though we will just key in our part number which is the STM32F072RB and if you notice then on the right hand slide as you were typing that part number in the list on the right hand side was getting smaller and smaller until we have only two parts left and if I move my screen width a bit wider you can see that we've got a BGA variant and a LQFP variant. So it's the LQFP variant we need to select. Now you've noticed on the top of this screen that the page has been populated. This is where you can now link to the data sheet, various documentations or the block diagram. But we don't need to do any of those. We're just going to double click on my blue highlighted line which is the RBTX and that will then go and generate our project which is set out for a 64 pin QFP to match what we have on our Nucleo board and you should hopefully now get presented with the pinout diagram. We now need to start adding our peripherals to our pinout diagram. So we'll go around each peripheral one by one. The first peripheral we will add is the temperature sensor which is part of the A to D converter. Now this doesn't have a physical pin, it's an internal connection but we still have to select it in the ADC. So if we expand the ADC you will see you have the 16 external channels and then the three internal channels that are connected to the ADC. And we need to put a tick into the temperature sensor channel. The next peripheral we need to add is USART number two, which is going to generate our virtual COM port back to our PC. So if we scroll down on the left hand side, we will get USART number 2. If we expand USART number 2, we need to select asynchronous mode and you should notice on your pinout diagram that PA2 and PA3 have now gone green. This means that those two pins have now been assigned to the USART. 
One of the nice features of the CubeMX tool is that most of the smaller digital peripherals have the ability to sit in different locations on the pinout diagram. And you can find out if that is possible by hovering your mouse over PA2, as I am doing there, and it says control click to show alternatives. So I will hold my control key down and now left click PA2 and you can see in the top right hand corner PA14 is flashing as blue every time I click my button. So this means that UR2TX can either sit at PA2 or PA14 on the pinout diagram. If you want to move UR2 to PA14, all you do is hold down the control key, your left mouse key, and then you just drag and release onto the PA14 pin that was highlighted blue. We are happy with this default configuration because in our schematics it's PA2 and PA3 that are connected to the virtual COM port at the top half of the Nucleo board so we don't want to change the configuration that we have currently on the screen. The next feature we need to enable is our serial wire debug. So our serial wire debug is part of our system function so we need to expand SYS on the left hand side and we need to put a tick box in debug serial wire and this should now have sent two more pins green on your pinout diagram which is PA14 and PA13 for our serial wire clock and serial wire data but you might now have noticed on the left hand side of the screen we have a yellow caution and a red line appeared. So this is telling you, the yellow caution will tell you that you have lost some parts of a peripheral and the red line will be the feature that you have actually lost. If you want to find out what has caused the problem you can hover over the caution and you can see which peripheral is now causing the conflict and the same goes if you hover over the red line you can see which peripheral is causing the conflict. We don't need that particular feature that is there which is wake up number three or wake up number four sorry so we are not too concerned that that feature has now gone red. As you populate your pinout diagram you will see more and more of these cautions and red features to let you know that a peripheral is either partially not available or completely not available. Now we also need to enable our two pins so we need to enable our PA5 for our LED and we also need to enable PC13 for our push button. On this particular pin diagram it's not too bad to find pins. You can quickly scan around the package and find the various pins that you're looking for. But if you were looking for PA5 on a 208 pin package, it might take some time. So we have a search box where you can type in port A. So you can now see all of port A flashing. And if you finish typing in PA5, you can now see PA5 flashing. So we have a quick way of finding all of the GPIOs that you need. So we now need to left click on PA5 and we need to set that to be our GPIO output. So this is for our LED. So we just put a tick in that box and it has now been changed to green and the definition is GPIO output. We now need to do the same for our push button, so our blue push button, which was on PC13. 
Again, left click, and that one is a GPIO input. That has now changed that pin to a green pin. If you want to use labels from this diagram, you can also do that. All you need to do is right click on the button you have pressed and you can click enter user label. And that label will get ported into your C code so you can use labels within your C code when you come to write the rest of your software. So now we should hopefully have six green pins highlighted on our pinout diagram. And that means we have assigned all the peripherals that we need for our Fermo regulator example. If we move across to the next tab, which is the clock configuration tab, we can have a look at the clock tree that is available in the STM32 F0. Now, if we had assigned external pins for our crystals on the pinout diagram, then the two items on the far left hand side of the screen would be blue and you would then have the ability to type in the frequency of your crystal that you have chosen. Because we're using the internal RC, there we didn't assign any pins externally for crystals, therefore we're going to use the HSI RC as our main clock source. Because we're only toggling an LED, we don't need high performance. So we're going to leave the clock settings as their default, which is eight megahertz. If you wanted to change the frequency of your clock source, then you would type in HCLK, so H clock in the middle of the screen, where it currently says eight, you can tap in 48, which is the largest available, and the system will automatically calculate the required PLL to get your 48 megahertz. If it's not available from the current clock source, then it'll prompt you to say it needs to change the clock source and then it will go and recalculate again using one of the other clock sources available on the chip. Also down in the bottom right hand corner of the screen you can see USAR number two clock mux. At the moment the default setting is going to use P clock number one which is the peripheral clock to run at 8 megahertz. If we wanted to use this device in low power mode, say stop mode, where the clock tree actually gets stopped, then we would need to change that clock mux to be LSE, and we would have had to have provided a low speed external clock to the device, and then USART number two would have the ability to wake the device from stop mode because it'll be running on a clock source that has not been stopped. But we don't need to change anything here, so we can move across to the next tab, which is the configuration tab. In this configuration view, this is where we can now add peripherals that have no physical pins. Things like the CRC, the watchdogs, timers 6 and 7 which are used to synchronise the DACs. And it's also a place where you can add the middlewares, so items like the Free Artos or FATFS if you were running a file system on the device. Also in these middlewares, if we had selected the peripheral of USB, then the USB libraries would have appeared up there in the middlewares so that you can configure the USB libraries. But we need to now go and configure our USART so that we can connect it to our PC externally. So if we click on our USART number two, 
we want to select a board rate of 9,600 board. So you can just click on the number and type in your 9,600. And we want our word length to be 8 bits. So this one is just on a drop down where we select 8 bits including parity. And that's all we need to set for the UART. So we can now click on apply in the bottom and then OK. So that is our USART now configured for what we want to do. The next peripheral we need to apply some settings to is the ADC. So inside the ADC there are just as many settings as there were with the UART and for this one so that we can read our temperature sensor we're going to slow our clock source down so our clock prescaler we need to put to be divided by number four now there's one other item that we need to set inside our ADC and that is our sampling time now the sampling time has to be calculated based on the information from the external analog device that we have connected or in this case the internal analog device we have connected so if we look at our data sheet in chapter 6 section 3.19 we have all the parameters for our temperature sensor now one of the parameters is the minimum sampling time required when reading the temperature sensor in the ADC for us that means we now need to calculate this value so if you remember from our clock tree we had a system clock of 8 megahertz. We have just set our ADC clock to divide by 4. Therefore, we have 2 megahertz entering our ADC sampling unit. This means we have 0.5 microseconds as our sampling time. We need a minimum of 4 microseconds. Therefore, we need a sampling time of 8 cycles. Now, if we hit our drop-down list in our CubeMX tool for the sampling time, there is no option for 8 cycles. So we have 7.5 or 13.5. 7.5 is not long enough. We won't get a clean enough reading or a reliable reading. So therefore, we will need to select 13.5 cycles as our sampling time. And just as before, we need to click Apply and OK. So that's all we need to do in the configuration. If we just have a look at the GPIO, and click on PA5 you can see it's already configured as output push pull and as we highlighted earlier the reset conditions of all the other features which are output level low no pull up pull down and maximum speed low are suitable for what we need so we do not need to change anything in this GPIO configuration so we can cancel that screen. Now we need to save our project and generate our code. To do that, we need to go into the projects section up on the top toolbar and go into settings. So in here, we now need to give our project a name and a location. 
So I will go and find myself a location. So I will generate a new folder, just as we did before, call it lab free. And then say open. So that's now given me a project path of hands on lab free. And I will also give it a name. I'll call it lab free again to follow the naming I have used for the rest of my projects. Now I need to set the tool chain. So we are using the Kyle Microvision, which has many other names and the name it refers to inside here is MDK Arm V5. So that is the tool chain that links to our Kyle Microvision that we have been using in all the other hands-on. So we can select that. And we need to do this for low layer libraries. If you remember from the presentation, Kibamex defaults to HAL. So we need to go on to advanced settings and we need to change all our HAL libraries to LL. So this is done via drop down boxes. So you have to do it for each of the peripherals and then you can click OK once you've completed that task with your settings. So now we are ready to generate our code. So we go project and generate code. So this now goes off to the repository, finds all the library files for the periphery that we have selected in our graphical interface, pull those into our project folder, which is lab number three. It also then goes and pulls out the Kyle template and loads all that into lab free so that we can now just click on the button in the middle of the screen which is open project so if we open the project Kyle will go and launch and in this particular case it's also launched the pack installer which means it's telling me that something is wrong uh, and it's telling me that there is a missing library pack in this particular uh, instance that is actually wrong, so there is a problem inside the Kyle tool on version 5.24 of Kyle. So we can cancel that. It tells me now that there is no F072RB, so we can OK that. We can close the pack installer as well. And we now need to go to our options for target. So if we click on our options for target, we need to go into our device tab now and we need to do exactly as we did with the first two hands on this morning and type in STM32F072RB and then click on our TX and then say OK. So for some reason, in the Kyle tool, only on version 5.24, there was a, an error. For some reason, it does not see the library pack when the library pack is installed in the device. If you are missing the library pack, then you will need to install it. But I know for a fact on my laptop, the library pack was there. So if we now expand all our folders here just so I can talk you through what has been pulled in. If I make that a little wider. So here you can see it's pulled in the startup file which is the initialization part. In our application and user section we have our main.c and our interrupt subroutine.c. Then we have all the HAL drivers or low layer drivers of the cases for what we've selected to cover all the periphery that we might use with inside our project. 
and then we have the CMSYS system file which is part of the ARM configurations that is needed. So all these files have been brought in. The rest of the peripheral drivers have not been brought in because we have not selected them. So if I open our main.c, we have quite a structured main.c, so there's quite a few comments there at the top. We have our includes, which will include main.h. So if you had any labels defined from your Cubamex tool, then they would come from the main.h. Then we have our private function prototypes. There is one for our GPIO peripheral, one for our ADC peripheral, and one for our USART peripheral. Then there are two more generic ones for the low layer library initialization and the system clock configuration. As we carry on scrolling down this screen, we will get to our main routine at line 74. And in main, you can see the low layer libraries get initialized. Then the system clock configuration gets initialized. This system clock configuration is what you saw in the clock screen inside the Cubamex tool. And then you get your free peripheral initializations. So these were the free sections in the configuration part of the Cubamex tool that are getting called to load our configurations for each of those peripherals we have selected. And then we have our empty while one loop. You might also notice as we've scrolled down the screen there are lots of these user code begin and user code end comments dotted all the way down this file. There's quite a lot of them actually in the main file. These are the equivalent of compiler directives for the Cubamex tool. If you type your code between a user code begin and a user code end, so line 101 as my screen is showing here, if you then chose to rerun the Cubamex tool, any code you've written between the begin and end would be kept. If you wrote some code at line, say, 103, which is between an end and a begin, then that bit of code would be lost when you reran your Cubamex tool, and it would get replaced by the standard template again. So we've put plenty of these user code begin and ends in the software so that we don't restrict your coding styles and techniques. And it also gives you the flexibility of writing the code wherever you want inside that main.c file. If we carry on down the code, you can now see the information that was brought in for the project. So we have the low layer library initialization, which is setting interrupt priorities. Then we have our system clock configuration in which is the information from the clock screen inside the Cubamex tool. We didn't change anything here, so most of this will be in its reset state, but you can say the HSI set calibration trimming is there. USART clock is set to be P clock one. So everything there is from the clock diagram. Then we have our ADC initialization. So there's one of the parameters that we changed was to get set our clock divide by four. And there is the other parameter that we changed, which is our sampling time of 13.5 cycles. And then down in the USART section, you will find that we've set a board rate of 9600. And we set our date to width to be eight bits. So this is all our configuration setting for the USART. You can also see there the alternate function has been enabled for pins 2 and 3 on port A. So that was our USART pins. 
and then right at the bottom we'll have our GPIO configuration for our pin 13 which is input and pin 5 which is output. So we've now done these top two boxes so we've now got to put our application code in to cover our loop for our ADC and our question is it above or below the threshold and then our transmission part which is has the button been pressed yes or no if it has then send our data over the USART so we're going to do exactly as we did in the first two hands-on we are go to our template which we saved or extracted from our user disk this morning and we now need to expand folder number seven developing an 8-bit application which is for our hands-on number three and go into the template folder and we need to open our main template ll.c and this time because our main.c is already structured we can't do a control a select everything and paste it directly into our main.c this time we've got to do it section by section so the first section we need to move in is our variables. So that is these top three lines there. So you want to control C. Then you go back to your Kyle environment and go all the way back to the top to line number 50, which is our private variables section, and then control V. So that puts our variables between a user code begin and a user code end. Then we go back to our template again. And we have a section for user code begin and end number two. So we will take those three lines. Copy those back to our Kyle environment or micro revision environment and this was user code begin and end number two so this is now going to line 103 and it's actually only two lines when the word wrap comes out of the equation from our text file and then the last section goes in our user code begin and end number three. And we take all of those lines. Remember not to take the user code begin and end number threes. Those are already in our main.c file in our Kyle environment. I'll control C. and paste those into user code begin at line 116. So that's our code now pasted in to our correct sections within our template that has been generated by our Cube MX software. As before there are some lines of code that need editing so we need to edit line 103 116 118 128 and 134 so if we look at our code what actually sits in user code begin and end number two is the enabling of the ADC then the first section of user code begin number three is 
the start of the ADC and reading the result. Then we have our ADC threshold question to enable or disable our LED. Then we have our question, is the push button pressed at line 132? And then line 134 is our transmission of our message across the UART. So we now need to start completing some of these question marks. So at line 103, we need to enable our ADC. Now, we can try using the help which is control space, um, find out what commands we've got. But in the low level library, there are quite a lot of commands. So you do need to start giving it a bit more of a hint on what the command should be. We can also go and look in the user manual for the libraries. So if you remember, oops, bear with me. If you remember we had our UM1785, which was our description of all our HAL and low layer commands. Said so it's a large document, 1320 pages. And we need to go and find the LL ADC section. So in here We've got lots of commands which tell you what's available inside the LLADC. Now I know for a fact the command that I'm after is on 658. And that is LLADC enable. So we need to start typing enable. And then now if I can go control space to bring up my help, there's the command, and that is the first command entered for what we need to do. So the next section where we need some editing is at line 116, and our comment there is start the ADC regular conversion. Now this is where you need to know a bit more about the ADC. This is why we say low level commands are more for the expert mode. Inside the ADC we have two modes. We have regular conversions and we have injected conversions. So, so you would need to have known that to decide that this one needs to be a regular. We've already put the REG for you in our tip screen there. But if you didn't know the ADC well, then you would have not known that there is a regular and injected version. So, so we need to start the ADC in regular conversion mode. So I'll go with the obvious. ST for start. Control space. Start conversion. Again, another fairly easy one to find. Now we need to read the regular conversion result. So we need to start and read a regular conversion result. So, we'll go for REG underscore read. So we've got a couple of answers now that might be correct. Read conversion data 10, 12 or 32. If you remember 
we are on a 12-bit A to D converter here. So read conversion data 12 is what we need to do here. The ADC is configurable, so you can set the ADC to be a 10-bit ADC or a 6 or 8-bit ADC as well. So we want 12 for our particular case here. So I'll let you have a try now with the remaining items. Another location where you can find information is from the .h files. As we've not built the project yet, we don't have the dependencies under each of these .c files. So I will hit the build. I will get errors because there are three red crosses still there on my screen. But it will then populate my dependencies and GPIO is the next section I'm looking for. So if I look in the GPIO.h file, again, you can find the various commands for GPIOs. So there's get pin mode, set output type, set pin speed, get pin speed, So there's your first command there, which is set output pin. So you can also find these commands in these .h's. So in that case, I will copy that part into my main.c. a bit further down you'll find the second command you need for the GPIO there which is reset output pin so you have one more left to find now which is the USART to transmit over the USART. So I will transmit and we set it to be data 8. And now my final caution has gone. So I can now build my project. So I now get zero errors and zero warnings. Because we've generated the project without going through the normal Kyle startup functions, we still need to check to make sure that the development tool is still correct. So we still want to talk to the ST link, not the U link, which is the default in the Kyle environment. So to do that, we need to go into options for target and the debug tab and we need to change our U link to be an ST link debugger. Then we need to go and check the settings to make sure our flash downloader is correct 128k and we can also, tick the box for reset and run when we just do the download function. 
and we can say OK. If you had a problem with your linker on the first two examples, then you might also need to go into the linker and make sure the tick box is there for use memory layout from target dialog. Once you've done that, you can select OK. And we can now enter debug. Before we actually run the code, we need to go and put the watch window in place for our variable, which was ADC value. So double click on ADC value, then right click and add ADC value to watch one. While we're on the same screen, we might as well do threshold as well. So double click to highlight in blue, then right click and add threshold to watch one. I prefer decimal values, so I will change both of mine to decimal by right clicking and removing the tick box. And now I can go and run my code and I can see that when my ADC value is cold, so my finger is not touching the chip, I'm at 1644. And when I warm the chip up, I drop down to about 1628. So therefore, I will need a threshold of about 1635 on mine. So just type in there 1635, hit enter. So when my chip is above my threshold of 1635, my green LED is on. When I warm my chip up, my green LED goes off. So before we proceed to the next part, I will save that 1635 into my code, so I need to stop debugging, terminate my debug, go back to my main.c file, all the way up to my variables at line 50, and type in 1635. Rebuild the project. and then re-enter debug. And run the code again, just to make sure everything works. So now we need to run the terminal window so that we can press our blue button and see the information appearing in our PC environment. So I will use TerraTerm Now, we now need to set up our serial port. Which was COM30 for me. 9600 board and 8-bit data. So now, I am currently sat with the temperature at ambient which means my green LED is on. So when I press my blue button, I should receive ones on my screen. So I will press my blue button now. And there we go, I get a packet of ones. There is no debounce software integrated into our application, so I get quite a lot of ones. And now if I warm my device up, my LED has gone off. My ADC value you can see on the screen is below my threshold. If I now press my blue button, I will get a packet of zeros go through. Wait for the board to warm up. My green LED comes on. And 
as it passes the threshold. And now when I press my button, again, I should get a packet of ones. You can see there is one random zero in that packet. When you catch the board on its threshold, like that, you will see that the ADC, as the temperature is going up and down, the ADC will give you so many zeros and so many one results because the live update you're seeing on the PC is quite slow in comparison to the speed of the microcontroller is looping around that loop, taking those ADC readings all the time. So we now have a complete project which is sending information back to our target board. We can also now use the HAL libraries. So if we go back to our project, we'll terminate the debug environment. go back to our cube environment tool and we will change our settings so I will go to project and settings and change all of these commands now to how and say OK and go project generate code again It's now going to go and pull in all the HAL libraries. This time, because my Kyle project is already open, I will just say close to that screen and go back to the Kyle environment where it will ask me, would I like to reload? So I will say yes to all of these yeses. Again, we still get the same error where the device pack has not been recognized wait for that. I'll cancel that. I'll get rid of my pack installer. I will go into my options for target and key in my device again. STM32F072RB. That's the TX I need. Okay. And now you can see that we've pulled in HAL drivers. And we've actually pulled in a few more drivers now because we've got the extended functions and the default functions. And you've got a lot more information that's part of the HAL software. So there's all these extra niceties, as I said, that are being pulled in as well into this project. Code-wise, not that much has to change. Our definition of variables stays the same. They're pure C, nothing to do with libraries, so we don't have to change anything there. What we had in user code beginning end number two is no longer needed. So we can delete lines 106 and 107. And now, what we need to put in user code begin number three is these few lines here. So I will copy this across and overwrite what we had in user code begin number three up to and including that bracket there, which looks fairly similar. Get the spelling correct. And so we can see that we start the ADC. We are polling for the conversion. We are getting the value loaded into our variable called ADC value. Testing it for the against the threshold. And then writing to the pin, pin set and right into the pin again, pin reset command, 
and then we're doing our transmit of one block of data to UART number two with a timeout value of 1000. So now we can build the code again. So it's now building with the HAL libraries. We need to check our options to make sure our debug tool is set for ST-Link. And we need to check our settings for the flash downloader are correct. And now we can enter debug. run the code I'm going to need to change my threshold now because my ambient is now at 1689 so I need to set it to be about 1680 And I can now launch my TerraTerm again, press my blue button, I get my bank of ones, warm the chip up, press my blue button again, I now get my bank of zeros, wait for it to pull down again. Press my button again, I get my bank of ones. So you can see there's not a great deal of difference between the code from the low layer libraries to the HAL libraries. The start part has been moved from user code begin to into that one statement there. So two lines have now become one. But most of the other statements are roughly the same amount of lines. Just the syntax of each line has now changed to match the different formatting of the libraries. So what have you learned in this section? So you've now had a play with the CubeMX tool to understand what the CubeMX tool can offer you, what it can do for you. You've had a play around with the low layer libraries and the HAL libraries. So you've seen the differences between what you do in the Kyle environment compared to direct register access to working with the libraries that are generated by the CubeMX. And you've had yet more practice of debugging using the Kyle Microvision toolchain. Hopefully you enjoyed the hands-on. And thank you for taking part in the migrating from 8 to 32-bit workshop.